Okay, so now back to the third of these three um, mini lectures on food ethics uh, in food and agriculture. I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. Okay, so this was the last thing that I covered was sort of really this, you know, kind of a, a menu of issues that come up that have ethical and moral dimensions to them in food and agriculture. Many more than I think most of us uh, would have thought coming into this class. And what we, what we, I noted, the, I also noted quickly at the end of one, the, the previous slide was that, you know, the challenge is that these things don't start on their own, right? Um, we're not, we can't make absolute choices about one of these rights, often without affecting other things. So this is uh, one of the challenges uh, of the complexity and the trade-offs which are noted um, is that we have food ethics is uh, we think about have to think about our food not just who we buy what store we buy it from you have to think about where that store sources food where did this processor source its ingredients what were the conditions under which those that food was raised uh, even the inputs that the farmer uses what do we know about that so there's a possibility for ethical challenges all along the way right which really is, makes things complex um, also, that complexity means it's tough to translate that into uh, simple legal responsibilities, especially if we're thinking about uh, the fact that different, there are different civil rights in different countries, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, the environmental regulation, how they're, they're implementing environmental regulation in country A might be different than country B. This, this, this is difficult in terms to kind of lay down in stone. And what we, they, the other thing that is noted by these, these authors is it's seldom possible to do just one thing in food ethics. Uh, doing almost anything in one morally important um, reason often involves one in practice that enforces evil of the other. So this is, uh, food ethics is, is, is complex and fraught. Uh, an area of food ethics is the right to food, right? So we think about this is a natural right of people might be, we might consider that a natural right, right? That, that, I, that I, am, I am a person existing in, a, in a, um, a moral society is that I should have the right to food. And that has been uh, enshrined in the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 2004, is that everyone has a right to, so these you might think of these as sort of natural rights, uh, right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, dot, dot, dot. So uh, we have a right to earn living, which uh, makes it possible for all of us to provide ourselves and our families with food and other critical um, inputs. And we might say uh, that this right is violated in, in a lot of contexts. Um, the right to, there's, and then we have, so that's just food, right? Uh, that contributes to our health and well being. So we might have, think about that sort of, what, do you, what about that food? It might need to have acceptable uh, food safety risk. No food is 100% safe, but it should have acceptable food safety risk. It shouldn't be, uh, there shouldn't be a risk that that has a damage to my health. Um, it should be nutritionally adequate. So it should meet my uh, needs for uh, nutrition for health and product, healthy and productive life. It should be culturally appropriate. Um, and then the thing with, so those are the things which sort of would, might add on to or this kind of natural right to food. Um, one of the challenges we have with sort of implementing right to food, that is this UN declaration, is where is it done? Is it really within families, within local communities, within a provincial government, within a global government, within a national government, sorry, within international governing relations? Where, where is that, um, how, how can that right, that human right to food be, um, be implemented? And, and that's relevant to the discussion we had about the role of food banks, for example, versus the role of the government. Is the government's job just to provide um, uh, a, an environment where people can earn a livelihood, uh, that's consistent with a healthy diet, 
and then leave it to them, leave it to individual families and decision makers on what they eat, or should the government be uh, reach further, right? Uh, right to providing providing food to us. And that's interesting questions in, that have been addressed in different ways in different areas of the world. Still staying with this idea of rights and duties, what are, uh, what are some of the other rights and duties? There's this human right to duty, and as Collier talked about, uh, we might have a duty of rescue, which might be a sort of a minimum amount of food to prevent people from starving. So that's what is uh, is triggered in us when we see, uh, when we're asked to respond to uh, images in the press of kind of needy kids uh, in poor countries who are starving. That's trying to trigger that duty of rescue that we have as, as individuals. Another type of right that's relevant to food and agriculture is property rights. So these are the, uh, these are, so the property is considered to be a flow, a benefit stream, which flows from a resource. So I have the, uh, the property of my house that I'm in now. Uh, so that's, I get housing benefit and security benefit from my house. Uh, my property right is my right to my house, right? Also with, in agriculture, we think about right to land, right to water, right to forests. What are those property rights which, are, uh, which, which individuals have? Another uh, right is uh, that may be impinged upon by agriculture is the right to a clean and safe environment. Um, often, in, uh, I'll give you an example from India, where that right to a clean and safe environment was used to have, to have governments uh, cause the switch uh, from gas-fueled um, taxis and public transport vehicles in Delhi to having natu liquid natural gas. So instead of emitting um, uh, carbon monoxide fumes, uh, they have a cleaner emission from uh, natural, natural gas, um, or they may require electric to have zero emissions. So that's the idea of right to clean and safe environment and agriculture, when agriculture say causes air pollution, like, like the, um, uh, the case of the um, straw burning or water pollution in the case of that um, manure dam breaching uh, that may impinge upon this right to clean and safe environment. In some places, they talk about the right to farm or the right to earn a, a living from farming. That's where we, uh, where some uh, protesters, be pro essentially protesting environmental damage and protesting uh, they think that agriculture is impinging upon their right to clean and safe environment. They are then a uh, set of picket lines and protests uh, and, and kind of call out farmers for impinging upon that right. Uh, state governments in the United States have passed, have responded by trying to protect agriculture from these accusations and, and, and harassment by having right to farm legislation, which basically says you can't protest uh, for, uh, for agriculture. Um, and, and I think we've hinted at that even here in Alberta when there were some protests last year. There were some hints uh, from the Kenny government of having a right to farm legislation. Um, I don't know how, for, how far that is now. Um, there may be group rights of Indigenous people to customary foods, so that might be uh, you know, a right to say salmon um, in, in, by BC uh, First Nations. Um, there might be right to privacy versus right to, to the freedom of information. So right to privacy uh, might say that uh, I, I should be private, I should have the right to, to farm however I want, and as and, and long as I don't impinge on others, I don't cause externalities, I should be able to do that. Um, but if we have remote sensing, we might see that you're, you're actually doing something on that land that, that we're not allowing. So you might be draining a wetland, which would be actually damage to a public, uh, public asset. So water bodies, permanent water bodies in Alberta are, are property of the Crown. So the property rights to that water actually is held by the Crown, even though it's on maybe held, maybe completely surrounded by a private farm. The farmer may say, stay away from my wetland because I have the right to privacy. The government may, may say, I have, the, I have the right to protect 
the wetland. So there's a, there might be challenges with that. Um, and the right or, or to eat or not eat different types of food. And we're gonna talk about that with policy framing and, and the case of raw milk next week. Um, interesting question with uh, ethics is, uh, and food and agriculture is who's responsible? And we've talked about that, I've talked about that a bit already in previous slides, is what's the role of governments? What's the role of communities? What's the role of companies or consumers or families? Um, and uh, what, uh, so as a consumer, uh, is it okay just to buy anything you see on the supermarket shelf or is there, do you actually have some responsibility for the effect of what you're, what you're consuming? Okay. Um, so these, there's a, so, so that's a set of things around food, really about our food consumption. Um, then we have issues of ethical issues within agriculture about how agriculture is done and the relationships between people and animals. Um, so, you know, one, some people would say that it is a, um, it is an ethical issue that we raise plants that could be consumed by people and instead use those plants to feed animals. So there, that might be seen as an ethical challenge. Um, there's also ethical issues about um, disposal of animal waste, and, and, I, and I've mentioned that already. These confined animal operations, for example, the North Carolina animal operations, the health risks it's generating for a particular disadvantaged group. Some people would say any killing of animal for food is an ethical issue. Um, discomfort to sentient animals, greenhouse gas emissions associated with food production, grazing versus animal feeding, uh, the use of antibiotics to can address bacterial infections in animals, um, all about how uh, the kind of the people animal relationship and, and our relationship with uh, food and agriculture. Then there's a set of is issues around uh, agriculture in the natural environment. So we may have, um, there may be trade-offs associated with technologies that uh, have low negative impact for each unit. So uh, when I practice organic agriculture, it may be that I have less impact, say, on the pest, on the um, insect population than if I practice conventional agriculture. But if inorganic, if organic agriculture is way less productive for that acre on that particular area of land, it may offset some of the benefits that, that there is on that particular area of land because you have to use so much more land to, to feed the population. Uh, a second issue about uh, our natural environment is what happens when we do genetic modification of our food? Um, is there unintended impacts of releasing genetically modified food into the environment? What kind of environmental impacts might it have? On the other hand, if you have a much higher productivity, you may, may avoid other types of environmental effects. So you may not have to clear as much grassland or forest land to produce the crops you need if you're using genetically modified food. So there may be a, a trade-off um, similar with this issue about clearing land. Okay, so the last, so I have two, two more slides uh, that I'll try to get you know, finish up now. Uh, this is about consumer ethics. So that was that question about, well, what is the, what's the responsibility of a consumer? Um, and uh, Barnhill talks, sort of encapsulates this with this quote, if something is produced in a way that is wrong, then it's always wrong to be a consumer of it. So that, that is something, that kind of principle would hold us responsible for that whole value chain that I talked about, but all the way back to the inputs that the farmer uses to produce the base product and then everything that goes into the processing and this processing and transportation uh, all along the way that would hold us responsible with that when we're in their supermarket making a choice, we should be aware of that whole chain. A, an, uh, an interesting kind of, you know, people may respond to say, it doesn't matter what I do because I'm so small compared to all the food that's bought. So if I don't, buy this uh, package of regular coffee, um, 
someone else will, right? So why should I buy instead this package of fair trade coffee? Someone else is going to come along and buy that. My fair trade purchase is only going to be you know, 0.000 some tiny proportion of the total, so it doesn't matter. So that's this idea of the inefficacy objection, that consumers may not make a difference uh, because they're small relative to the total. And therefore, because of that, it may need, the only way that that really may be effective is when, uh, when we all urge each other to do it and we move as a community and make choices as a community. Um, other people with, uh, may affect, may um, be opposed, for example, to certain types of, raising certain types of animals for food and have religious restrictions on their diets uh, uh, as part of that. And they may see, you know, as other societies are getting more wealthy, they're consuming more and more and more of these animal products um, that again might be seen as inefficacy. In, 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 Parent inefficacy because so, so much is happening. So finally, the last slide then is this idea of, of food social justice um, is about um, when we feel that there's in, in injustice uh, in society. Uh, what what are some of the kind of the issues that are coming up? Um, examples uh, is are people in the food chain treated ethically and fairly, and there's concerns now uh, during COVID-19 that some people, some people in some uh, of the food industry are not being fair, treated fairly and ethically, uh, given that they're taking extra risks on behalf of all of us. Um, it might be seen as food injustice if healthy food is very expensive, uh, and therefore uh, it's actually not possible in for people in many parts of the world, and we saw that with the type of diet that people were eating, had on their plates. Uh, we might think of uh, food injustice as a food desert where lots of people uh, have poor access to healthy food, uh, partly because they live far from a grocery store and don't have a car or easy access to that type of transport. That might be seen as an injustice. Um, there might be racism or sexism in the food sector. Uh, in different parts in, the, in processing or primary production or uh, in uh, food service. Um, we're concerned about indigenous people losing access to foods that are traditional through their culture, identity, and economy. Um, and then finally, maybe policies. Um, policies may promote healthy eating, um, but those policies, if they, they really impinge upon my freedom of choice, then they can be seen as um, sort of the, the nanny state, right? The, the idea of Big Brother trying to make these choices for me when really I should be left to make my own choices and get from the information uh, and the financial ability to make good choices for myself. So that, that's the end of that, this set of uh, mini lectures.